he going? It doesn't. Does it let me go live yet? Yes. Yes. Here we go. Cool. <laughs> you put on lips. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hi. So I see we have quite a few people joining us, and um, so I am going to. Oh, hold on. Here we go. You've got a delay. <laughs> you put on lips. Hey everyone, welcome. Hi. So I see we have quite a few people joining us. And um, so I am going to. Oh, hold on. <laughs> I, I see. Delay. No, my, when I do this, it launches multiple versions of the browser. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And so uh, when that happens, I got it going on different places. So I have it on different screens. <laughs> anyway, welcome, Cheryl. Hi, Lauren. Hi, everybody. We're so excited that you joined us. Yes. And we have a nice crowd here watching. Um, Good. And this is great. I also just posted it over at Facebook that to remind everybody to come over and join us. So today um, we are going to talk about controlling the alcohol ink and why you might want to do that. And some great, uh, Cheryl's going to share some great tips and pointers. Um, she's a master of controlling alcohol inks, as we all know. And so we are um, here tonight to talk about that. So while we're in our discussion and, and Cheryl's talking, I'll be monitoring also the comments over on YouTube. So if you have questions or whatever, um, we will try to get to them and, and answer them for you. So um, Cheryl, you wanna just take a second, and introduce yourself to people who may not know who you are? Sure, my name is Cheryl Williams and it's just so hard to know how to introduce yourself. Um, I've been painting with alcohol inks probably for eight or nine years, which to some people sounds like a long time. Um, I started in watercolor, then I went into alcohol inks and developed all kinds of classes to help teach people how to control inks and how to paint with them. Then came back to watercolor and now I'm learning oil painting. So I'm studying all kinds of mediums. Um, I think what's kind of exciting is this made me really realize what are the benefits of alcohol ink? And one of the things that you can do with AI that you cannot do, certainly with watercolor or oils, is those poured backgrounds. And um, I'm gonna have different samples that I'll show you and I'll try to figure out how to make things work so that you can see them. So this is a, a painting of Iris that I did in alcohol ink several years ago. There is no way I could have got that background with watercolor or oils. I couldn't have done it. And so I think that's a really neat benefit. And then the colors of the inks are so intense and vibrant that um, it really looks it makes me look at alcohol ink with all kinds of newfound affection. Yep. Yeah, so you've been for the past six months or whatever. I mean, most people watching probably know who you are. So Cheryl's been teaching um, alcohol inks for quite a while. She had the um, the Academy of Alcohol Inks, which we now mm -hmm. converted to Create Smart Academy, which is a, um, a website where we have all sorts of courses dedicated to alcohol ink and mixed media. And it features, I think, Cheryl, how many courses do you have there? Like 35? Oh, or something? I have something like that. There are full courses that take many weeks to complete. And then there are, for some people who just want to paint a, a specific painting, there are lots and lots of singles as well. And also what's kind of cool is those courses, even though I did them a couple of years ago, they haven't lost anything. They're just as valuable as they were when we first did them. Um, so it's exciting for people to know that those courses are out there. And I know that there's a whole lot of my prior students that are here to, with us tonight. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so it's just, it's so cool to see the progress that people make from starting to do pours and then getting a lots of different techniques and then moving on to doing pets and water and all kinds of intense realistic art 
right. um, with their alcohol inks. So I'm so proud of all the students and all the work that they put into the class. Yeah, I mean, you can actually go and look at some of her students' works on the, on the website. So like Cheryl has one like master course. It's like from beginning to end, it's like 30 weeks worth of, or something like that, right, Cheryl? Mm -hmm. Of yeah. um, instruction on alcohol ink. I mean, it's uh, it basically, it's got everything you'd wanna know about alcohol ink in this course. And, um, and if you go to that page for that, for that class, you will see, go down to the bottom, you will see some of the work of her students and it's phenomenal. And, you know, blow, it'll blow your mind. And, you know, you, so might not think, you might not think I could never do that, but you can. You can, yep. as long as things are presented step by step. Right. So you don't make any giant leaps. We just make things in little pieces that you can chew in on a little bit at a time, get comfortable, get relaxed with it, and then add some more techniques as you go. Right. Right. And that's how I like. one plug for you, Cheryl. Those okay. are all on sale right now, too. So mm -hmm. if you go to Create Smart Academy, I'll put a link in the comments for everyone. But if, if you go to Create Smart Academy um, and go to, to, to um, instructors, um, you'll see Cheryl Williams' page. You can see all our courses there. And you'll see it's called From Drips to Drama is her master class on alcohol inks. And then she has a bunch of other classes, too, some single courses and then some different level courses. Um, she also has her level one and level two bundle on sale until October 24th. So check that out as well. Great. All right. So I'm done hey. plugging. I have okay. to a sponsored message. Um, so let's jump into and, and share some really good um, information with these people. Many people watching may or may not have figured out how to control the inks or even may not even realize that they're controllable. So I'm just going to turn it over to you, Cheryl, and let you run yeah. with it. And when Laurie and I were talking about what to do for this webinar, we thought, you know, what's the most profound thing that happened? I think for me is when I realized I can control the inks. It was, um, I mean, just earth shattering. And in fact, I was going back through some old paintings and I did hundreds of four by six cards. And I've got them all saved. And some of them are just little drips, a couple colors put together but I was trying and trying and trying. And then when the light hit on how to control it, I was just so thrilled because I like to paint things people can recognize. And I like to try to get the emotion, um, you know, from animals, from people, from, from whatever it is, I like to evoke that emotion with my students. So I'm gonna take you through kind of from the first moments of control into some tech specific techniques. So the one thing that I, I think a lot of us started with were dreamscapes with June Rollins. And this is an example of a dreamscape. And what's kind of neat is that you pour the ink in lines across the page and I'll switch to another one just because I like the colors. Okay, that's really pretty. Um, and you're not using a brush. You can use all the different kinds of tools, but just by laying down the ink, you can start to imagine this is a landscape. The little moon helps, but just by pouring your layers and then adding additional layers going across, you can, you know, most people are gonna think that is a landscape. And that's kind of the first stage of making something representational. Now, this is another one that I did in the same way, but I decided I wanted it to look Southwest. So I took a, um, a coffee stir and while the ink was still wet, I moved the ink up and down and across to try to give it, playing around on the screen here, that look of the buttes in the Southwest and a little bit of water and reflection. So we haven't, at this point, we haven't gone to using brushes. And the main word you're gonna remember is evaporation. So we're not there yet. I'm gonna do a little tease for evaporation. <laughs> okay. And then the next step that I found was really successful was to pour the inks and then use 
a brush to kind of make these mountains, but to use markers to do a silhouette. And what's so cool is, guess what? It looks like a painting. There's a picture there. There's a story already. Silhouettes are a terrific way to work with alcohol inks because you only need a black marker and whatever colors you want to go ahead and pour. This is another silhouette. It's a kind of a funky looking horse, but it still, it tells the story. There's a horse there. There's something that you can see. And you've got that beautiful poured background that you can get with alcohol inks and you can't really get with anything else. So those are some neat steps to start getting control. Then the next thing I wanna talk about is what is ink? A lot of us, when we're first starting out, we haven't been told over and over again what it is. So I'll tell you what the ink is. The ink is dye, just like writ dye. And it's suspended in alcohol rather than when you use watercolor paints, those are pigments, which are little particles, suspended in water. Now it's interesting about alcohol inks because it's dye. Dye has a much smaller particle. It's like you stir it up. Um, if you take some red dye, put it in water and stir it up, it looks perfectly clear and perfectly dispersed across everything. Well, that's what we're painting of. We're painting with this dye. So what's really cool is alcohol evaporates off and it leaves behind the, the color, the dye, the colorant is left behind. And so if you can control the evaporation, you can control how much dye there is on your brush, because I like to paint with brushes. So here, this is the magic tool. There is another palette, so this is a palette that's made by Tim Holtz that has little, um, little square areas and a nice lid that folds down. So what's happened with, to, with the um, alcohol ink in here? Well, it's evaporated and there's nothing left behind but the dye. But if I was to take a brush and dip it in a little bit of alcohol and dip it in one of these wells, guess what? You have something to paint with again. So you can have palettes with tons of colors on them. You can carry them with you wherever you wanna go. And as long as you have something with some alcohol in it and a brush, then you can go ahead and you can reconstitute the dye that's in the palette. Now, generally when I'm painting with alcohol ink, I'm not using a dried palette. I'm putting the alcohol ink in the palette and I wait for it. You can kind of see this one. <laughs> see how it's kind of a dark edge on it? It'll get that dark edge and that's where there's concentrated dye. And when it gets that dark edge, I'll go ahead and I'll put my brush where that dark edge is. You can see some of these other ones have different dark edges on them. Or if I wanna paint something that's not really intense, I'll just use the area where the alcohol has made contact with the dye. So what happens is when you've got that concentrated, I mean, it's like hot chocolate. So if you have chocolate syrup, it's a lot more intense than a hot chocolate that you're drinking. That's and a you good can, analogy. I, well, we love chocolate, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know that was the first thing that came to mind. My husband's walking around, he loves chocolate cookies. So yeah, if you have chocolate syrup, you can imagine, you could take a brush and chocolate syrup and you could draw for a long time on whatever it is that you want to draw on. Um, and if you take your brush and you put it in the hot chocolate, it's not going to be as dark. You're still going to go ahead and be putting some chocolate on there, but it's going to be lighter in color because you've got that mixture. So it's up to you to kind of fool around and see how intense do you want um, your color to be that you're painting with. 
So Cheryl, we have we do have a question, and may, we may be jumping ahead, but I'll go ahead. It's okay. And it's okay. And let you know what it is. Um, uh, Louise is asking, what kind of paper did you use to paint the irises on? I, I painted it on. Yeah, yeah, I painted it on Yupo, and that makes the substrate makes a lot of difference with alcohol ink because you can, because it's not porous, so the ink just sits on that surface. It, in watercolor, when you paint, so much of your interaction is interacting with how wet the paper is. So the, the, um, the pigment and the water sink into the paper. And that doesn't happen with Yupo paper. And that also doesn't happen with Nara, Nara or Kirkland, or if you're using tiles, we're always looking for a surface that's not porous so it doesn't sink in. Because what happens when it does is it's not as vibrant. It starts to look more dull. And I think a lot of what attracts us to the alcohol inks is the color. I mean, it's so vibrant and it's so translucent. It's just beautiful. So, um, we, yeah, I used Yupo paper. Um, mostly when I did my alcohol inks, it was in the Yupo para paper era, if you can call it that, before Nara paper was out. But I understand people just love that paper and that substrate. Um, and it was really before there was a good black. So I did lots of kinds of things to get good blacks um, to paint with my alcohol inks as well. I hope, Louise, I hope that answers your question. Laura, I see your lips going, but you don't have any volume on. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, I didn't want to interrupt or anything. That's if right. I happened to make loud noise. But anyway, um, yeah, I was just going to say to everyone watching, if um, you have questions for Cheryl, I'm, I am monitoring the comments and stuff. So you can ask there and we can fill those at the end when Cheryl's done. So we don't, she doesn't lose her train of thought. She's got some really good information to share with us. So. That's okay. Just throw them at me. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, this is an exercise that we do in the level two class. And what we're learning here is how to use a brush and alcohol ink. And what's important, let me see, you know what that side? I have it on two sides. Ooh, how exciting. Okay, doesn't matter. Is that you place your brush in the center of this petal and you watch the ink to see how far does it go. Because depending on how much alcohol there is, it's gonna move. So we kind of use this exercise as a way to place the ink in the center and then kind of push it out to the edges. And in this case, we've done several layers on top. So you get a combination of colors um, while you're practicing this. And hey, listen, everybody, if it goes outside the lines, who cares? But you have to learn, if I have this amount of alcohol, how far is it gonna move so that when you're working on an area, you can decide, do I have the right alcohol? And what I would do is go towards the lesser alcohol to start with so that you can slowly move things out. And Karen Walker calls this push and glide. And I like that description. I think that's a really good description of this technique. And you can do it with apples, pear, any still, I mean, you can really do it with anything, but give yourself a shape, take some alcohol in your ink, and maybe start with your ink right out of the bottle and place it in the shape and see how far it goes. Um, Another point that's kind of interesting is the inks vary as far as how much alcohol is in that bottle. So how do you know? And I would tell you a really easy trick is if the color is pale, it has a lot of alcohol. 
If the color is deep and rich, there's less alcohol in it. You can take a deep, rich color and you can add alcohol to it to make it lighter and lighter and paler. And you can make a whole range of values as far as dark and light with one ink based on how much alcohol you add to that color. Now, if you're using a pale color like these are that we did in this little example, you, the, you can't, well, I shouldn't say you can't. You can make them even lighter. You can make them almost white by adding more alcohol. But if you want to get them to be dark, you're gonna have to let them evaporate in the palette and then use that intense color. So just know, it, it's kind of cool getting like looking at your bottles and seeing, okay, these guys are, these are all pale colors and that's what I like. I like that look. You're gonna have more alcohol moving, more dye around than if you're painting with the deep, rich colors. Those are gonna be easier to control because there's not as much alcohol in them right out of the bottle. Make sense to everybody? Okay, cool. Okay, so now the next stage, and again, Lori, if you have questions that pertain, go for it. Um, the next stage is, this is a little one. I did this at my mom's house when I was visiting her in LA, a long time ago, anyway. But what this is, is you've got a poured background, but then you have a focal point or a main center of interest that's painted in detail. So how do you do that? How do you keep that spot white? Now I understand with some of the new papers, it's a lot easier to keep those areas white or you can lift back to the white. But in the old days, let me tell you, we couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't get anything back to white. Um, I did use some clay board, which is like clay that's um, spread real thinly on a board and it's beautiful for alcohol ink, but you can scratch off a layer of the clay to get back to the white. So that's just, you know, for those of you that want to, you know, do, um, Get some great cactus with the needles. That's really cool to scrape back to the white or whiskers on cats and, you know, cats and dogs. You can scrape back to the white. But yeah. yes, in these days, what we had to do, and it looks a little bit like it's cut out and glued on there. It's not, and I guess you could do that, but I masked it first. There is um, a latex product that's masking fluid. And wherever you put it, when you put your ink on top, the ink isn't going to stick to the paper. Right. So I was you, gonna, yeah, I was going to say add to that, Cheryl, that that. So we used Yupo was one of our first non-porous surface. It was, and Yupo was kind of known as the erasable watercolor paper is how it was first described to me. But what it it, it has that um, plasticky type texture that allows you to lift to white. Um, and there are other substrates too that are like that, like you can use the back of like Kirkland brand photo paper and stuff like that. But some of the newer um, substrates on the market with like the Nara paper, um, Graphics has their Durabrites. And um, I've been using lately like the back of um, Amazon Basics photo paper. Those will all lift all the way to white. So they don't stain, which is... Yeah. If we had had that back in 2012, when we all started doing the, working with alcohol inks, that would have been great. But we used to have to go through with frisket. Remember the frisket or the contact oh, yeah. the sticky stuff? But um, I just wanted to interject and tell people that and since we were talking substrates, that those are some good options. I still love Yupo. I still, it's one of my favorites because a lot of times I don't need to lift a white with stuff I do. But, um, but yeah, there are other options out there. And I think that's something about the differences between alcohol ink, watercolor, and oil painting is that with both alcohol ink and watercolor, there's not a lot that you can do to modify what you've done. 
you can add another layer with both of them. You can add layer and layer and layer to get a depth and a richness of color. Um, but with oil paints, if something's wrong, you just paint over it. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's really, really strange, but it's opaque rather than being translucent. And translucent, that ability to see through is like looking through a stained glass window. We just love the translucency of the colors. So those of you that don't know what masking is. Um, I'm gonna go off the screen again. Okay, <laughs> bye. Bye. Okay. So masking is generally a fluid. It can also come in a film and you can cut out the film and put it down on your surface. And then when you pour, nothing sticks. And then you lift off the film, but the film's kind of pricey. And the masking fluid is, the fluid is less pricey. Um, and you use that with your brush and you paint the area that you want to stay the natural color of the paper. And then when you're done with your pouring, um, actually you, you let your masking fluid set up so that it's, it's dried, it's, it's the latex material. And then you can, when you're done pouring, you peel that off and you've got a spot in like in this one where I could paint this little guy because it was pure white underneath. You can get wild with masking fluid and how you use it, it's a whole lot of fun. Um, you can do snow drops. And so if you think about it, if you take a toothbrush and put some masking fluid on it and just run your thumb over the toothbrush, it's gonna spray all over the place. It's perfect for snow. What else could you need for winter? And then you don't have to lift back all of those white places. Um, one thing you do need to do is you've got to um, put soap on your brush before you use it with masking fluid. And then as soon as you're done with your brush, get that thing washed off because otherwise that latex will set up and your brush is now nothing but to be used for masking fluid. So that's just a little warning about it. Okay, so let's go back to this guy. So how do we do this now? So I had a little drawing um, that showed me what the patterns and the colors were that I wanted to use. And boy, is that fun going through all your inks and trying to figure out what colors am I gonna use that are gonna get me this picture? Um, but again, put the inks, I pour them into the palette. <laughs> it's so funny because everything's backwards from what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> pour them into the palette, move this out of here, okay. And um, then you take your brush and you can dip them into what's in the palette or you can put them in a little alcohol first then go into your palette and then place it into the section you want. Now, just like we did with the flower, you're gonna to wanna to know how far that's gonna go so that you don't cover up the whole subject by the first time you put down some of your alcohol ink. But it's a whole lot of fun to do. It really, I just find that it's a blast. So that's an example there. I have another one. And this little butterfly, also what makes it so neat is the pouring of the background. Okay. Now in this one, I guess I should go back. Another awesome way to control your alcohol inks is by using markers, because markers are alcohol ink. If they say on them that they're permanent, guess what? They are alcohol ink. And it's very easy to use a marker to draw in areas. So in this one, we have a masked um, monarch butterfly. And then we used a marker to put in the different areas of the petals and the different black areas. Now the really fine stuff that's done with a pen. And there are certain pens that play really well with alcohol. 
the pens, I haven't found any pens that are alcohol ink, but they work really well with alcohol ink. So you can do these detail lines that we have in this butterfly with a pen. And it's pretty exciting when you find a really good white pen, like a white Posca. Are you guys still using that? I guess I need to ask, is Posca the go-to? Yeah. For a long time, we used the Signo um, Uniball. Uniball, yeah. Yeah, but the Uniball is just not as intense white as the Posca is. So it just depends on what, you're, what the effect is that you're trying to get. But so now, you know, when you're trying to control your alcohol inks, you're doing combinations of evaporated ink markers, and boy, are those addicting to buy. I cannot tell you how many markers I have. <laughs> it's terrible, you know, you just see, oh, here's another sale on this and that, but. Yeah, so uh, we do have a question. It's sure. kind of going back to the uh, seahorse. Okay. She wanted to know, did you use alcohol ink to paint the seahorse? And if she asked if you used a brush. Yes, I did. <laughs> the answer is yes. So what kind of a brush do you use? Um, teeny weeny little stuff. Now that's if you're crazy like I am. I like all these little details. So can you imagine doing the eyeball? You know, you, you can't use a brush that's that big, right? That's not gonna work. So you gotta get little teeny weeny brushes. And when I was first asking about brushes and alcohol inks, I was told, don't use your good brushes. I didn't know why but don't use them. You know, it's like this scary thing. God forbid I should grab a watercolor brush and use them with my alcohol inks. Guess what? It's fine to use your good brushes. Just clean them. What a cheap brush does, there's the Taclons, which are like kind of a, a nylon. Um, they're really inexpensive. You can buy a whole set of them for four bucks, you know, of all different sizes. And you know, when you're first starting out, that works great. And I think they're actually a little easier to control than a really good quality watercolor brush. But with those tacklons, just look for stuff that's little. And if it's not little enough, you can cut some of the hairs out of it. So, you know, he's just, I have collections of zillions of teeny, all these teeny weeny little brushes. But when I thought, you know what? I don't trust that I can't use a good brush. So I started using some of my good brushes. And what I found with those is they held a lot more ink. They went a lot farther. And if I was trying to do a sweep, like a sweep of a wave, I remember is that was when this all happened. You're trying to do a sweep of a wave and you don't want it to be little strokes. You want it to kind of be a large shape. If you use a, a nice, um, black silver, which in, there's a not very expensive, but a nice black silver brush, it'll hold a ton of ink and you can make a swash that'll all hold together as one large shape. So Karen is asking, asking, um, are the brushes designed for alcohol inks? And then okay. what are the brushes made from? Are they synthetic or are they natural fibers? Most people start out with synthetic you know, and there's not much that really isn't synthetic anyway. Even when I buy really expensive brushes, they're a combination of synthetic and natural. You don't, but the natural hairs are the ones, the natural hairs and the synthetic natural hairs, because they make fake ones, the fake squirrel. It's not from a squirrel, but it acts like a squirrel natural brush. They hold a lot more ink. So for most people, and I think all of these pictures in here, I just use synthetics. It was just kind of later in my experience with alcohol inks. I just thought I was just gonna be a bad kid and use a good brush and see what happened. Well, the alcohol did not hurt my brush. I had heard that story. I just never had that problem with it. Um, but again, I clean my brushes. You take good care of your babies, you know? <laughs> so yeah. sure, sure synthetics are fine um anything that's labeled for watercolor i think it's going to work nicely because even if it's a synthetic and a cheap synthetic at that 
Um, it's just because it's got more flex to it than an oil brush or an acrylic brush are a little bit stiffer. And so they're also asking, how do, how do, you, how do you clean your brushes? Okay, well, I should have got out my... <laughs> I always use a shot glass with alcohol. I mean, I have zillions of shot glasses. And you know, when you go visit someplace and there's a silly shot glasses for sale, I have a whole bunch of those and I put my alcohol in there. As so, long as you don't take shots of alcohol, we're okay. No, I'm not drinking, believe me, I'm not, not drinking any kind of alcohol. <laughs> I know, it's different kind of alcohol. Um, but you take your, your brush with your alcohol in it and swish it around in the alcohol and you don't need to press in, just allow it to be in the alcohol and the swishing is fine. And then paper towel, back and forth, back and forth, squeeze it through a paper towel till you can swish it and put it in a paper towel and there's no more color coming off onto the paper towel and you know your brush is clean. So Louise wants to know, do you have a class for painting the iris flower? So you've got a couple that's included in, right? Like a couple of your bundles. Like I know it's in your drips to drama. No, this iris, I don't have a class on doing it. Oh, this okay. particular one. I mean, this well, you got something called, similar in it. I've seen I do. I have some similar paintings. This one was real early in my experience and it just went well. It's just like nothing went wrong the whole time I was doing it. It was just a big amen. And I don't have the original anymore. I sold it. Breaks my heart. Um, but <laughs> I don't have a class on that iris. But I have classes on plenty. Maybe we need one, Cheryl. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, there is the Lupin class or the, the purple peonies. Oh, purple tulip. Okay. It's very similar in technique. So that's a single class is the purple tulip and you use a whole range of pinks and purples and the the details are really in, in the center of the flower in the same it's all the little parts right to right make right. seeds cool and you know another plug 10 percent off until october 24th yeah, 10 percent <laughs> off all those classes yep so you can find all there's all kinds of florals there's all kinds it's just kind of what whatever hits your heart yeah great okay so then I'm going to talk, this is, you know, we talked a little bit about markers and pens. So this is kind of as abstract as I get. Um, I have seen Serena Weber's abstract class. What a talent. I mean, she is magic. She can do the most beautiful abstracts and they make sense and she understands what she's doing. So in this one, the big deal was the pour. So you can see where it's poured. And then I went back on top and I used both ink and pen work. So you can see the little, see all those little rectangly thingies? But inside those rectangles, there's multiple colors. So that was done on top of the pour. And I don't know if iguanas are your thing, <laughs> but um, I think they're really neat looking. The other thing that you can do is I lifted out the spines is you can take a little alcohol in your brush and you can lift. There are tools for lifting that are really incredible. What's the one I always use? Oh, the chameleon blender pen. So my favorite pen for lifting is by um, a company called Chameleon and their blender pen is amazing. It's got a very soft tip on it. They call it a Japanese, it's like made out of felt. It's very, um, very pointed and very small and it doesn't put out much of the blending solution, just a little bit of it at a time. You got yours, Lori? I got one. Uh, yeah, I'm going to um, bring okay. myself back onto the camera here. Good. Let me remove the spotlight and then go to the camera. Yeah, so I was just, I don't have a chameleon. I was going <laughs> to ask you, <laughs> sorry. Mine, mine is actually from Michael's. It's an artist loft version, but it, but it's very similar. It's, um, it's got that same sort of felt tip on it. I'm trying to hold it close here. Okay. Hopefully my camera will focus right. I got one and it's brand new. 
Oh, well. <laughs> That's right. I keep talking while I dig this thing out of here. <laughs> That's okay. Anyway, so I use a number of different blending pens. I don't have the chameleon one, but like I said, I got this. <gasps> I'm one. sending this to you. I have the Artist Loft and I have the, I don't think I have it. At, oh yeah, I do. Look, I always have everything right here. Alcohol ink blending pen that I actually put alcohol in. This is, this is a Tim Holtz product. Um, you can get this from Amazon. Um, they have, it has like a felt tip pen too. It does the same thing, but I don't know. I could not live without my blender pens with alcohol ink, especially for realistic painting. Okay. So now let me show you the chameleon because I got one. Can yep. you see how little that is? That's tinier. Yes. Oh, I'm telling you, it's the coolest thing ever. That is cool. Okay. So that's like very, that's like <laughs> almost like a, what, three millimeter tipper or something like I that. I don't, I mean, it goes to nothing. I know. Wow. That's cool. Anyway. So I always require people to buy these when they take my classes. And I don't have one. <laughs> I'm sending you, I'm sending you this brand new one that I found in here. Okay. So we took care of that. Yes. But lifting is, is real neat to do too. Okay, how are we doing? We're doing good. We are, um, we, we have, uh, we're, we're good. Okay, so I wanted to show, um, this is another one. This is one of the classes, is this fox. And look at that background. I mean, it's just the coolest thing. You can't do it with anything else. Nope. And then when you come in, in one of the classes, we learn how to paint fur. So what is fur is just a lot of little strokes. I mean, it's not anything. And layers, right, Cheryl? Like I, I've, layers, I've taken yeah. your fur classes and you teach that better than anybody I've ever seen for any medium. Um, Whoa. Yeah. So when you do fur, it's not just a color. Your eyeball, well, Lori, you love this because you love the pointillism stuff. Yeah, exactly. Your eyeball puts all these colors together to come up with what it is. And so you use a combination of colors, lots of layers to get. Oh, wait, color. Teresa's here. Hi, Teresa. Hey. So Teresa says Blix discontinued the chameleon blender pen. She just ordered four. Well, don't buy it from Blix, just buy it from chameleon. <laughs> I think they even have them. If you go to Michael's, some Michael's carry it too. I've never, well. I live out in the boonies, so who knows? <laughs> yeah. I said some. Some, 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 some. Um, I'll grab one more fur. This is better. I hope that it won't reflect too much. Oh, yeah, that's a lot of reflection. Yeah. But you can see how many colors there are in there. So that's what makes fur look natural is having lots of colors and your strokes need to go the right direction. In layers, right? Like so. In layers, yeah. I just have lots of them out. I'm just, yeah, in layers. So I've done lots of, lots of fur. I mean, I kind of love kitties and puppy dogs and all that stuff. Um, but somebody was asking me about feathers. So um, this is when I did real early. And this is an owl. <laughs> Isn't that cute? It's adorable. But again, it's like, it's combinations of colors. And you guys all love doing that because when you're pouring, you're combining all over the place. And then the colors go into each other and they make new colors. So what makes this look like feathers? There's not anything really specific. When I do... It's a feather exercise. Um, Imagination. <laughs> okay, now this really looks like feathers, right? It does, yes. Okay. So the trick with feathers is that they are in layers from bottom to top. That's just how they grow. So if you're going to start out, you're going to want to start with this lowest blue layer. And you'll see those are layered on top of each other too, because there's like this one is underneath this one. So how do you depict that something's underneath something else? Well, you can see that there, there are some edges, but the colors here are staying in this area and then this one in this area. Then these red ones come up on top. And those, again, for feathers, 
you've got long streaks in them. I guess the main thing that I would say in anything that you're painting realistically, got to just observe. Got to go look at feathers. So I have chickens. So I ran around and <laughs> I've got feathers all over the place because they leave them all the time. Yeah, Karen um, says, thank you for that feather explanation. She was hoping for that. <laughs> oh, good. Karen Phillips. Okay, good. I'm glad that that helps. And it's just looking really closely, like look how many different kinds of feathers there are in this little study. So if you do a rooster, man, they are fabulous. They've got so many different colors, so many different kinds of feathers. And so you just try to replicate what it is that you're looking at. So I hope that helps for feathers. And Tawny says also shadows, the shadows behind. Yes. You know, I mean, we can talk about shadows all day long. <laughs> shadows are so critical. So you see, I can't point. Okay. Where the white is. I think it looks right to us. I think you're seeing it backwards, but it's, it's, it's okay. Okay, so you see where the white is and then see right behind the white? Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh, where it's really dark? Mm -hmm. That's because the light is shining on those white feathers and it's casting a shadow on the red. Right. That's cool. That's cool. Okay. So good for Tawny. Okay, and then um, one last thing is portraits are so hard. So I'll tell you how I cheat with alcohol ink portraits because it's just hard to make the skin look smooth enough. So I don't do the skin. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a secret. You just don't do it. <laughs> that's a secret. It's like, don't even try. You can try. But I have a class doing this young man. And all I did is I just turned the light up really high, got rid of the skin tones. And I put in, the hair was more fun than anything. It's, it's impossible to get that smooth tones with alcohol ink. So unless you're going for like an abstracty type face. Yeah. I have tried for many years. I know. I have that's tried to. So that's an excellent point about just let the eye imagine that. Yes. By, with the shadows and the, and the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because your eye, your eye doesn't know there's no skin. <laughs> We know there's no skin, but your eye doesn't know there's no skin. It sees the eyes, mouth, nose. There's little nice little shadows on the side where his hair is coming over. You got a portrait and you did it with alcohol ink. It is, there are some people out there that are really good at getting skin tones with alcohol ink. Not me. But, oh, it's really hard. You know, you can use up a whole lot of Camellia blender pens trying to get there. <laughs> So anyway, so that's my little trick is um, the other thing that does work pretty good for skin. And then in the girl portrait, I do this is I put the alcohol ink on a makeup pad and I just push it around the paper like that. Just I pretend I'm putting on makeup and it's, <laughs> and it's so light. And because the makeup pad is absorbent, you hardly get any color that comes out on there but it's enough and so you just pretend you know you just go over it and you don't get any edges because that's what bugs me is I get edges between shadows between the different shapes in your right face. right and, and so Bonnie says she loves doing skin so hey Bonnie if you have any tips feel free to share them in the comments for everyone too well yeah we'd love to hear it and I know and Bonnie has just exploded with her girls yes. and so she is doing such beautiful pictures um, of people and you know what people are really engaging to the heart it really just it yes. speaks to you you get the people really like it yeah like Teresa Santa Claus is right oh Teresa Santa Claus yeah see their skin and she didn't <laughs> all right so maybe we'll have to have a, a little get together to talk about skin oh yeah I think that'd be a good one but it's, it's hard. So just to um, recap, um, I think going back, the whys of learning how to control the ink is so that you can paint anything. Um, there, are, there are people that love to paint 
things, stuff that's recognizable, things that you can see, even if it's a still life, you still need to be able to control the inks to use it. And for some people, alcohol ink is their first medium. So why not learn how to control it? Um, it's not that hard. It takes practice. And so much of it is fooling around with this little palette and seeing what happens with the evaporation. Um, one little side note, depends on where you live, how much evaporation you get. Because I live in the desert, you know, high desert of Colorado. And we don't have any humidity. I mean, our humidity is, you know, high at 16%. And then I know people that live up in upstate New York and it's so humid. I used to live in Chicago. I mean, you could cut it with a knife and eat it. I mean, just the air was so filled with humidity. Well, that's water. So you don't get as much evaporation in a high humid area. But then in your house, you probably keep your house at a comfortable humidity. So just know that where you live and what environment you're in, will affect how much evaporation or how long it takes to evaporate. Eventually it'll all evaporate off. Okay. So, you know, I encourage people to learn how to control their inks. And again, you can take it in simple phases of just how do I pour a landscape? How do I pour a background and do a little bit that looks like something um, to where you get, where you do detail paintings that are very realistic using alcohol inks. And it's a great medium. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's see. If, are, are there any other questions? Um, well, I'm going to remove the spotlight and put this on gallery so we can chat for just a little bit. Um, all very good information. So, so thankful that you, it's been a while, Cheryl. So a lot of people are, are happy to see you. I know I miss everybody. <laughs> and people ask me, you know, Hey, where's Cheryl? I'm like, Oh, she's here. She's here. You'll see her soon. You know, she's, she's just, uh, do, she's learning oil and how to take like the techniques from oil painting and how that can incorporate into alcoholics. So we can always count on you for that kind of stuff. And that's really good information. Yeah. Um, I know that I love talking to you because I would learn something every time I talk to you. So <laughs> that's oh, always thanks so much. I know. And I miss everybody too. So just say, sorry, I'm <laughs> just <laughs> painting in a different medium. And yeah, no see? apologies. Absolutely. Yeah. No apologies. I mean, I think that's, we all have to grow. It's, I mean, like you said, some people, um, alcohol ink is their original medium. That was me. Mm -hmm. um, I never painted before until I picked up alcohol ink and I started with blobs <laughs> Just, yeah. like, oh, yeah. just like most everyone does you yeah. start with blobs and then I figured out well I needed to use a non porch paper and then it, it didn't take me long before I had to know how to do more depiction you know with the yeah. ink and yeah and it was it was for me it was Karen too who, mm -hmm. who taught me that you had to do the evaporation thing and and then even when you learn that you need to let it evaporate you still have to learn just like you said and taught us those stages so important right. Right. And then to add those techniques on top. So it really is a process of growing from, you know, growing from, you know, blobs to depiction. But yes. any, if, if I could do it with alcohol ink, anyone can do it. And it's a matter of training your eye and learning the right techniques and the principles of, yeah. of lights and values and perspective and just kind of like the, the few laws there are. And other than right. that, there's no rules in art, right? Exactly. So, yeah, there are things that will certainly help you if you're trying to do something. And so I've been learning a lot more about different um, art. I don't know. They're not really rules. They're just techniques. And so right now I'm doing um, some charcoal drawing. And that's really cool. There is um, a thing called the, the bark plates that are back in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And you learn how to replicate something in charcoal. So now I have to learn how to sharpen charcoal right because I know I'm not <laughs> doing it right. Um, but that that teaches you so much about shading and values, which I love. But now I'm starting with oil painting to learn about composition because since you can change everything, 
you don't have to leave it the way it was in the photograph. So now I use like 20 to 30 photographs to combine all together to make an, an image. I never would have tried that before. Wow. And I've been using Procreate on the iPad yeah. to come up with a design for a painting. Now, everything that I did in alcohol ink and watercolors, I always spent hours and hours looking for the perfect photograph and for my reference photo. And now, I kind of think of what's an idea. I maybe pick two photos that kind of put the main idea together, come up with what the compositional um, plan is going to be, and then add more and more references. Um, I was I painted these horses. I painted this one horse five times right on top of it because I didn't like the horse I had. I didn't like the way it was turned. I wanted to change it to a Palomino. And so I had to go out and find all these photos to figure out what does a Palomino look like? And what does it look like when it has its head down in the water? So that is way, that's where my journey has been taking me is how do I actually put together my own idea? And I don't have to worry about copyright problems because it's my, and now it ain't out of my head. I don't paint out of my head. My husband, he paints out of his head, but not me. I need reference photos. But sometimes I need lots and lots of reference photos to create some new idea. So that's all available to you. And you can, any of those things that you do, like using Proc Procreate to come up with your alcohol ink painting, same thing. It's just a tool. Use combining different reference photos, just a tool. Once you know how to control that evaporation, you can paint anything. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Well, thank you, Cheryl. Um, so yeah. I have a favor to ask everyone who's watching. Um, I'd be interested to know in the comments, you know, where you are in your stage. Are, are you, do you consider yourself more of abstract? Are you more of, um, are you a uh, realistic painter? Um, are you in between? Are you in progress? I just like to kind of know where people are and, you know, so that we can kind of, um, gear our content that we create and information that we bring to the, to the larger audience. So it's always good to know like um, that. So, um, so K Katrina, we have it here in the comments. She wants to know where we can go to your, your courses. So I'll put the link in again, but here in the comments, um, I've linked through it a couple of times. It's also pinned to the top and it takes you right directly to Cheryl's courses. Um, if you use the coupon code SW, Oh, what is it? Hold on one second. SW fall 10. So SWFALL10, you can get 10% off. So you use that at, 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 at checkout for uh, Cheryl's stuff. So you can look at the link to her courses or post at the top. Also want to say that if you haven't joined over at the Alcohol Inc. Art community, head over to the, we have the whole website dedicated to Alcohol Inc. there. Um, so it's alcoholinc.community in your browser. And we do have a holiday conference coming up. So there's some information on the Alcohol Inc. Art community uh, website about that too, that you can check out. But definitely check out Cheryl and her courses. If you are on a journey learning Alcohol Inks and you want to take it to the next level, uh, Cheryl's your lady. And I just yeah. wanted to say that don't be intimidated by some of the advanced paintings that I showed right, you. Right. Uh, the bundle that we're um, that we've got on sale now takes you from basic pouring and basic learning about the inks into some of the techniques that we saw the uh, monarch butterflies part of that class. And so you can don't worry, things are going to go step by step to yeah. be make sense and be easy and be successful because I want you all to be successful. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Cheryl. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I think that's a wrap. We spent, we spent a nice hour and we got some really good information. Hopefully that was helpful for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you haven't um, subscribed to the Alcoholic Art Community YouTube channel right here where you're watching, do so um, because we hope to bring you more and more content like this on a regular basis. So definitely check that out. Okay. All right. Good night. Good night. Happy fall. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye.